Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Binance VIP Voices. My name is Eduardo Morrison from Binance Institutional Sales Team at Europe and Latin America, and I will be your host today for today's episode. As usual, a fast disclaimer before we start today's episode. Digital asset prices are subject to high market risk and price volatility. This means that the value of your investment may go up as well as down, and you may not get back the amount invested. You're solely responsible for your investment decisions. And please note that the conversations taking place today do not constitute investment advice of any kind. With that said, we're ready to start another captivating episode of our podcast. Binance VIP Voices is a space where we embark on a profound exploration into the intellects of institutional figures and industry trailblazers. Our podcast gracefully navigates a diverse array of subjects within the digital asset industry, including institutional asset management, sophisticated trading, strategies employed by institutions, macroeconomic insights, and beyond. Without further ado, we have a great set of panelists for today, which include David Fauchier from Nickel Digital Asset Management, Martin Bednall, CEO of Jacobi Asset Management, and Fabio Frontini from Abraxas Capital or HECA Funds. I will now want to turn the spotlight to our guests. Uh, it will be great if you can please share a glimpse of your background, your current role, and tell our audience a bit about your firm. Uh, Martin, if you want to start. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's great to be it's great to be on this. Uh, so my background is in traditional finance. I've worked for large and small asset managers. Uh, I've worked within the European and global ETF industry for over 18 years now. Uh, currently, I am the CEO of Jacobi Asset Management. Uh, Jacobi Asset Management launched and listed the first spot Bitcoin ETF in Europe. Uh, so it's it's the only product in Europe offering exposure to Bitcoin that is structured as a fund, is structured as an ETF. Uh, so that was that's listed on Euronext Amsterdam with the ticker Bcoin, um, and launched in in August this year. Thank you, Martin, and, and welcome, uh, David. Your turn. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, so I joined Nickel in 2020 to launch and run our multi-manager fund here. And Nickel itself has been around uh, since 2019 and it's a crypto-focused regulated asset management business based in London. And prior to Nickel, I ran a firm called Cambrial, which was one of the early crypto market neutral funder funds. Welcome, thank you, David. Um, Fabio. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Good morning to everyone here in the panel as well. I'm Fabio Frontini. I am the founder and a director of Abraxa Capital Management. It's an FCA regulated investment manager in the UK. I'm also principal and the director of ECA Fund Seeker, that is currently, I think, the largest pool of open ended funds in crypto. We specialize in arbitrage strategies. And yeah, my background, as, uh, as Martin just said for him on his own, is, uh, is in traditional finance. I've been running proprietary trading desk, uh, specialized in option and uh, fixed income derivatives for about 24 years, actually before in 2017, uh, entering the crypto space and launching the ECA fund uh, suite of products in 2018. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you and, and welcome all. So let's let's get started with with our questions. So first one, I, I will uh, encourage Martin to to help us on this one. I will be, you know, ETFs have become a focal point of discussion and anticipation in the crypto community. Could you please explain what ETFs are and why are they hold such significance for uh, the digital assets industry at this point in time? Sure. Well, an ETF is is structured just like any other investment fund that uh, that that people would would buy and invest into so typically called mutual funds and and the structures are different in different parts of the world um so but but they're but they're in essence a, a sort of a corporate vehicle that issues multiple different funds within that vehicle they all have segregated assets and liabilities 
Um, and and the difference that an ETF has over a, a sort of standard investment fund is that it gets listed on a stock exchange or one or more stock exchanges. Uh, and so you can investors can buy and sell shares in, in ETFs just like they would buy and sell shares in, in, in equities or, or in other listed products. So you can buy an ETF in your standard brokerage account, um, sometimes commission-free. Some, some providers will, will you will allow you to trade um, ETFs commission-free. So they've just really become the vehicle of choice for a, a lot of institutional and, and retail investors. Um, so it's it's great that the, the you know this crypto market and, and as we'll talk about the in the US that uh, investors will be able to get access to to digital assets through this vehicle. Thank you very much. Um, and, and the second question is a bit you know to to follow up on this. Um, many traditional banks and finance companies are starting to get into cryptocurrencies right now so how are etfs helping with these uh, transition or move and why are they so important uh, in finance today um fabio if you want to take this one sorry eduardo actually it was it was to me the question because i missed the last piece <laughs> no problem let me repeat myself so no no i got the question actually i, I think it was it was up to me to answer actually i didn't get the very last part actually of the question um Yeah, I mean, it's a very, it's a very good question. I think uh, uh, the important part is uh, that this the ETF approval, if it happens, uh, everybody now is expecting early January. Um, it will give finally like a, a like a stamp, like an official stamp, some regulatory approval or something that is it will give credibility and acceptance of you know, digital assets in the traditional uh, in the traditional finance side. Uh, so obviously this will increase the institutional participation, retail participation as well. Potentially could create more price stability in the market actually, because uh, you know, generally speaking, ETF increase price stability. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, it's not guaranteed that this is going to happen because it's a quite a peculiar asset. So we have to see exactly what is going to happen. Uh, but yeah, very important because. Uh, As I said, you know, they, they give credibility of, uh, of the asset in itself. The fact that there is this regulatory approval is extremely, extremely important and will allow more and more participants actually to enter the space with confidence. Yeah, I mean, I, just, to, just to add to that, I think wrapping crypto assets into the ETF, you know, within the ETF structure and being able to offer crypto Through ETFs is, is a great way to connect the sort of the digital asset ecosystem with the with the traditional finance system. Um, you know, we'll, the, it'll be you know traditional finance people know how to trade ETFs. They they're used to using them, and then you've just got this you know you've got this the exposure in there, and the connectivity between the two will just be enhanced through the through the the the, the usage of ETFs and the, and the connectivity that it provides. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, Next question, and David, this will be great to, to get your insights on this as, as we want to understand how do you perceive the role of crypto native asset managers in contrast to the traditional finance entities that are entering to the crypto space uh, right now? Sure. So I guess competition is coming um, for sure, but crypto native firms In, in asset management, and particularly ones on the quant systematic side, which is where we sit, I think have this huge head start. Um, they will still benefit from this kind of regulatory and reputational risk arbitrage. Um, the best of them are going to be able to trade this emerging TradFi infrastructure, as well as CFI and DeFi. And being able to cover all of these things together and trade them against each other is I think going to be an increasingly uh, important kind of structural edge. Um, but maybe more broadly, like we've seen a lot of crypto quant tourism in 2021 and 22, and it was very damaging. You had a lot of uh, multi-manager firms and funds of funds and tried for asset managers sort of very tactically kind of jumping into crypto rather than strategically. And they burnt a lot of bridges. Um, they built teams then fired them, then rehired them and took out full page ads in the FT saying they were launching this product. And then suddenly they're not and they're switching mandates and 
it's it's very damaging, I think, for their ability to attract and retain talent. And in crypto, there is nothing that's off the shelf. Um, and so all of the things that you assume that you would just get uh, when you come from the TradFi world really exist and you need to build them from scratch. And the ability to attract and retain talent that can build the required trading and back office and legal and risk management infrastructure that's necessary to do this at a competitive level um, and be ready when the market turns is very important. And certainly we and others have benefited for the past year from what I would call kind of refugee teams and talent from these tourists um, who from one day to the next had no job because the executive committee decided that there was going to be no more crypto at the firm. And I think historically, the TradFi participation in crypto has been one of kind of catching the tops rather than building infrastructure and preparing for the good times. So broadly, very long cycle, uh, for sure, like competition is, is coming now. But I think as we look at kind of this cycle and, and perhaps the next, I think the the traditional or the, the crypto native firms will have uh, will retain that edge that they've had um, for a few years to come. Yeah, got it. So so talent is the main advantage for now, and hopefully you know crypto native firms can can maintain it. Um, yeah. Fabio, I would say you know you you've been on both sides, right? And the native crypto native asset management firm, and also coming from TradFi. Uh, do you want to uh, add additional points to, to David and uh, your comments? Yeah, I honestly, I think David is absolutely right. I think the competitive advantage of uh, incumbents, so to say, is, is, is here to stay regardless of ETF coming through because there's still going to be like segmentation in the market from regulated institution, ETF on one side, and the unregulated institution and, uh, you know, decentralized finance, all the other stuff on the other side. There's still going to be for quite a long time, I think, space for uh, arbitrage opportunity, uh, better implementation of trades, uh, more efficient capital allocation of existing players compared to the incumbent. That doesn't mean that the incumbent will not get more aggressive and they're going to be uh, uh, you know, worse to be fought on, uh, on cost cutting from, uh, and more efficiency demanded to intermediaries like exchanges or like custodians or whatever. But he's actually going to be good, actually, from the overall market. But I agree entirely with David. I mean, he's, there, is a, there is quite a, still a large, large gap to be filled by new incumbents from the institutional side before we're able to really to compete with people who have actually gained expertise, uh, uh, knowledge of the market. And uh, it's, it's still a very fragmented and, uh, and segmented market still, even with the ETF coming. It will increase concentration, obviously, and increase liquidity on some aspects like futures, for instance, and listed products, generally speaking. But uh, I'm not in the camp of thinking, uh, yeah, that's it. And now the, the Goldman Sachs, sorry, of the situation arrives and nobody else is able to do anything anymore. There's going to be still plenty of space uh, for people who actually invested the last five years in this field. And, 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 and there should be enough, enough room to have to have a passive element to it and an active element so i think what you guys are doing where you you're you know you you're very much on the active side and and, and you have this sort of you know when we were when i when i was at blackrock it was very much a, a position of let's have a barbell strategy you have a passive range and you have an active range and and that's that's the way that the market will 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 move so as etfs come in as a passive vehicle you're getting beta exposure to to you know, Bitcoin and then you know whatever else is out there, single coin or even some multi-coin products that you you could go after. But that, but that's a sort of beta exposure. Whereas you know you where you guys are experts at this um, and and you know as somewhat of, of an efficient inefficient market still that that you know there's the potential for alpha out there as well. So you know the, both ETFs and and specialist crypto managers can can coexist side by side. Uh, and we'll do, and we'll grow side by side. Yeah, yeah th thank you, Martin. And let, let's continue with you on this one. So, can you please tell us uh, a bit more about you know Jacobi's successful uh, journey for listing a, a Bitcoin ETF on the Euronext Amsterdam Exchange, and 
Then after that, what are your thoughts in general on Europe appearing to have a first mover advantage on, on the ETF uh, rollout? Well, our journey has been a quite a long one. Um, it, it is it, it's uh, to get to, to get regulated products out there and to get them listed on an exchange is 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 not a not an easy process. So it, it's taken about three years to get the product, you know, from uh, initial idea to getting regulated to getting the service providers, some aspects of the market and situations in the market, predominantly the FTX situation didn't help. Um, you know, people pull out, people, providers then pull out, and you have to look again, and you have to, you know, reassess everything. So it's it's been a it's been a long journey, um, and you have to persevere um, when you do something for the first time. Um, as as I said, it's the first you know, regulated ETF in Europe. Uh, it, it's it's not easy, and there's there's plenty of barriers in the way. Um, and you persevere and, and you and you get there. And so long as you believe that it's the right product and you're structuring it in the right way, thinking about what we try to do is is come to the market with a product that is is breaking down the hurdles that anybody would have wanting to, particularly institution and, and sort of qualified investors, because that's all we can all we can sort of market to at the moment. Uh, regulator doesn't allow us to go after retail, so there's still there's still hurdles in our way. But we, we're, we're trying to knock down those hurdles to, to make it as easy as possible for these investors to come into the market to, to start to invest in in crypto assets. You know, we talk to these these investors and they say we don't really know enough about it. We we sort of feel like we should be doing something, but we just don't know what that is. And and so what we're here, I mean, I think all of us are here to is to educate. The market is to is to you know look for those early adopters and, and build that momentum. So it, it's it's not an it's not an easy uh, process and it takes time. And, and I think you know the, the other guys will have, will have felt the same, right? You just you, you persevere, you show that you've got a good product, and you know and eventually the success will come of that. Um, can you repeat the second part of the question for me? No, thank you, thank you for the initial overview. The second part was related to the Europe. Uh, First mover advantage. <laughs> yeah. So, so what? I mean, Canada's had uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs for for quite some time as well. So they they were actually really the first sort of uh, major player. But you know, compared to the US, um, you know, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of attention I've never seen in the time I've worked in the ETF market. Just so much uh, anticipation of of a product launch that there has been for this for these spot Bitcoin ETFs. There's general the general view at the moment is is that that you know they're coming sooner so, sooner rather than later you know the Bloomberg analysts that that uh, review the ETF market they put a 90% probability that it'll be early January I think as we get close to that maybe that maybe that those are, those odds are coming down a bit but the difference is now is the SEC are actively engaging with the, the with a, a bunch of the firms that are have got these uh, applications in. And so there is movement there and, and that engagement and the changes that these applicate applicants keep making to their applications, clearly in conversations with the SEC um, about that, just gets us closer and closer and closer. And we've seen the price of um, of Bitcoin rise considerably uh, in the last few months. And it's been predominantly on the back of that, of the, the anticipation of, of the approval of these. So now I think the the, the US CTF market and the, and the European ETF market are very different. Um, they don't sort of sort of travel well between those two regions. So, you know, it is entirely a separate sort of regulatory process and, and, and market dynamic there. Um, so there's, there's no sort of concept of first mover advantage of Europe over the US um, in that regard. Under, understood. Um, David, I want to, to follow up uh, uh, with you on, on, on the, you know, the involvement of, of Grayscale Investment Trust with the possible approval of the ETF in the U.S., right? We know that they have more or less around 21 billion AUM with, under this product. What, what, what do you think are the implications of converting it into an ETF first and then how might this affect the inflow and outflow of funds on, on this specific product? 
you're you're on mute, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, for GBTC specifically, or the Grayscale product specifically, I think it's a very interesting kind of question, and it's going to look what happens to the flows on day one that will look very different to the other ETFs, assuming they're all approved on the same day. Um, everybody and their mother did the like GBTC arbitrage trade. And this was just the most popular trade I've almost ever seen in, you know, spring and summer of 21. And the trade basically involved um, taking Bitcoin and uh, putting Bitcoin into the trust and receiving shares at par. And those shares were trading on the exchange at a premium. And you had to hold them for six months and then they would unlock and then you could sell them. And everybody piled into this trade. And what happened in that six month period is that it went from trading at a premium to trading at a discount. And everyone has basically been stuck in this product because GBTC is not redeemable. And you'd have to sell these shares at a, at a huge discount to the net asset value. Um, so essentially you're, you bought a Bitcoin at the fair price of Bitcoin and now you'd be selling it at a 30 or 50% discount. If it be suddenly becomes redeemable, like people will be able to get that Bitcoin out. So the, the discount disappears. Um, and I think like between 21 and today, a lot of, there's been a lot of ill feeling towards Grayscale. Um, they played the situation wonderfully well for many years. They made all the right noises and protests about like not having redeemability and blaming the SEC but without actually trying too hard to make it happen. Um, they've also had some very public legal troubles. Uh, Barry Silbert, who's the CEO, has been exposed as a bit of a huckster as well. Like For all of those people that have been trapped in a trade that they thought would last for six months and have lost money on it, um, who don't want the Bitcoin exposure, I think that will be outflows. But then on top of that, you're going to have outflows from people that just don't want to be in GBTC anymore. Um, and so I think like what we might see on day one is very large outflows coming out of GBTC, potentially moving straight into other ETFs. Um, I'm not sure, but the dynamics there are so certainly are going to be very volatile for the initial days and weeks. Got it. Thank you for, for your points. Uh, Fabio, you want to comment yeah. uh, on this? Yes. No, I, I, again, I agree with, uh, with David. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult to predict exactly how the flows will develop, but I mean, I think we are all agreeing here that is, or they cut the fees down to sub what the other ETF actually are charging, or otherwise it's going to go to zero uh, whenever they convert, because the cost of grayscale is way too high compared to the ETF uh, that are going to possibly be approved uh, in early January. So I, the flows, I, there is definitely people who are actually long uh, outright grayscale because it was the only way in which they could get exposure and uh, yeah they will obviously make up uh, you know the, the gap that still exists uh, actually when the ETF is approved are they gonna get out uh, yeah but uh, you know if they are Bitcoin uh, investors they will probably switch uh, people that will just get out just taking profit boo, yeah probably yes I mean the arbitrageur obviously will unwind but will have no effect on the market in the sense that we will uh, sell the grayscale, we'll buy something else. So I, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact in terms of market direction. Um, yeah, it's going to be pretty tricky because it depends who moves first, uh, what speed, uh, these kind of things. It's going to be a bit complicated to, to monitor. Uh, but yeah, but we, I, I don't think people will be happy to stay in grayscale. E even if they put the fees, honestly, at the same level as the other ones, uh, I think they're going to lose a lot of assets. Probably in favor of a new ETF, a new income, a new when you're coming to you know in, in the space. Yeah, makes sense. And, and understanding, you know, I want to get a bit more uh, your thoughts, Fabio, on how can we best leverage the role that banks and broker dealers hold in the wealth management industry, uh, given that they manage a huge part of when it comes to encouraging more Bitcoin ETF investments to their end clients or investors. Right. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, on this one, I think, uh, you know, it gets back a bit of what Martin said about uh, education. And I mean, let's put it this way. Just just having a regulated product in the eco space does not automatically imply that everybody's going to jump in and buying it because they have to allocate, I don't know, 0.5 percent of it because it's there. 
Uh, there are a lot of people who, regardless of ETF existence or not, they will not really still uh, talk to their clients or, or telling them to invest because they don't still understand uh, what all this Mayhem is about in a way. And uh, so the education and uh, you know, information is still going to be paramount from everyone. Let's put it this way, the existence of ETF will definitely improve the possibility of communicating to these now closed channels because, as, as we said before, the uh, regulatory umbrella and the de facto approval of existence of this asset class will make it an investable product. And that actually, you know, if you are not invested in this and it ends up outperforming like everything else, you're going to be a bit of a fool and you eventually will lose assets. So, you know, asset manager, wealth manager will have to uh, come to terms to the fact that they have to do something, they have to allocate something. Uh, they will allocate only the passive product. Uh, yes, on the other side, they, you know, once they allocate the passive product, you know, as Martin said before as well, they will also look at the active products in the space. So people like David, uh, like ourselves and other funds around. And that will, you know, we will see some flows in both ways. Also, the fact that, uh, you know, the leverage will also come to the fact that you could actually use the ETF or any other product that could be maybe started to be eligible as collateral with some institution. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people could actually start using the ETF as, a, as an alternative way of uh, doing some more arbitrage strategies and more, more, more complicated or more like structured products, so to say. I think there are going to be a lot of a lot of things that we are not even envisaging right now. We can see that happening, but if you, I, my personal view, it is nothing is going to happen overnight. So it's not going to be like okay, they announce the ETF in a month. Oh my God, you know, everybody's going to jump in. I don't know. Uh, I think it will take time, and I think uh, you know, education of people as well is still going to be paramount, like it's always been. It's going to be easier. It's just going to be easier to go through people because the existence of ATF is giving the framework uh, for them to invest in uh, in crypto. Yeah, I mean, Fabio brings up a really good point there, is that the when when the SEC, it's not, I don't think we, anyone thinks it's an if anymore, so when the SEC approves the, the, the Bitcoin ETFs, the fact that the SEC has, has approved this vehicle means that regulators around the world uh, and institutional investors will then start to think, right, we need to do more ourselves on this. We need to change our stance. The SEC, you know, the SEC will will lead the way. So, for example, in the you know, in UK, the FCA doesn't allow crypto products to be sold to retail. And when the SEC allows US retail, it's not going to have an immediate impact on the FCA, but clearly it will have a positive impact on, on, the, S, on the FCA's view of that. Um, and, and that will just have a, you know, a snowball effect. Then institutional investors, again, you know, I mentioned earlier that they sort of say we don't really know what to do here. Again, when the likes of BlackRock and, and Fidelity uh, get an ETF in the US, that brings it more into the mainstream. That brings it, it makes it easier for them to talk about it internally. It makes it easier for these team, investment teams to have those conversations and to start to really think about investing in in digital assets that that a lot of them aren't really there yet on that so it just has a really good snowball effect um once this once this approval happens even if the even if money doesn't flood in on day one it's just the fact that it's been approved the legitimacy that it gives digital assets is is that's a that's to me the biggest thing Great, thank you, Martin. Um, David, I want uh, like a follow up on this question. So, for example, on your end, having a regulated fund, have you seen these type of you know distribution channels with wealth managers, investment advisors, uh, uh, come to a positive traction for your own fund, or not yet uh, particularly? Um, it's certainly picked up over the last few months, but I don't think it has anything to do with the ETF. I think it's more to do with uh, I think post FTX, crypto became sort of a toxic asset class uh, for people to discuss or bring up in investment committees. Uh, and a lot of attention kind of left the space. And we've seen this in previous bear markets as well. And then suddenly, as with everything, narrative sort of follows price. And the price action on, on crypto has been quite good this year. And people have been warming up to the asset class again. Uh, but our arena is very much private funds with 
uh, allocators looking for market neutral returns from a systematic actively traded fund. So it's very different to what I think the conversations we're having are very different to the ones that someone like Martin would be having. Got it. Okay. Uh, appreciate your, your comments here. Um, Martin, uh, this one is uh, for you initially. So what would you think are the potential risks or roadblocks that might come up when you know an investor decides or do their own research for on investing into an ETF? And how can this be mitigated or analyzed? Well, so, I mean, ETFs, as, as we mentioned, are a, a very well-known, very well-traded, well-used product. There's still an awful lot of people out there um, who, who don't know what an ETF is anyway, uh, even in the US, right? They, 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 the biggest, still, still the biggest uh, issue for the ETF market is, is investor education. Um, and so um, that, you know, that's one thing they, they need to understand what an ETF is. And then I think the roadblock isn't necessarily the ETF itself, it's crypto. So what I see from, from our perspective is, is that when I talk to, to, to sort of platforms and, and, and such like that, the fact that the underlying is crypto, they still are more wary of that. There's still a lot more compliance. There's a lot more due diligence. So some of these, some of the ways that you would normally get into an ETF might not be open to everybody at the beginning. Um, so I think that's the sort of roadblock that will, is likely to come up around these products. Um, cause we, cause I see it now and I'm sure that the same will happen in the U S. Um, and, and, but, but Ultimately, over time, it'll, that'll all be unwound, and 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 you know, ETFs are are a great product. They're well structured. They've got great investor protection built into them. They're heavily regulated, both on, on the regulators' perspective and exchange perspective. So, um, it to me that you know why I do this is because I think they're the best vehicle for institutional and retail to get exposure to to to, to multiple assets. So long as there's enough liquidity. So one of the key things is, is like, what's next after Bitcoin? Do we get Ethereum? Do we get, other, you know, Solana? Whatever these coins are, as as a as a as a uh, product that you can come in and out of quickly, um, you the underlying liquidity needs to be there for that market to function properly. So some of the risks that you might have is if if things get you know run away with themselves and you know ETFs start giving exposure to you know, low liquidity assets, then that could cause problems. But I think the regulators are going to, you know, they, they're not going to, the SEC will not be quick to, to bring, you know, to, to approve an Ethereum product anyway, an, ET, an Ethereum ETF. I think they're going to see how the Bitcoin one does and it'll be some time before they even uh, approve Ethereum. But, um, you know, the, the risks are ultimately the risks of investing in crypto. That's the biggest risk that anybody will have. Understood. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to transition to, to the last question and, and I would like to hear your thoughts or, or, or everyone here on, on this. Right. So imagine, you know, tomorrow or well, let, let's be more realistic, you know, early Jan, as, as Fabio mentioned, is the expectation. Uh, we get the, the, the approval of the ETF on the U.S. Is the BTC market and the network specifically, could, could those like both cope? With the level of demand, and and how would you know what would be the reaction on that? Shall I start? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it this way. Um, I think obviously will depend on the uh, subscription in the ETF uh, because uh, I don't know. It's a bit difficult to quantify honestly what is going to happen the first few days if the subscription are in the orders of billions. Uh, it could create a problem simply because uh, arbitrageurs like ours, like us, like Nickel or whatever, we start to keep the market in line, given that most likely the uh, ETF uh, uh, players that get approved uh, will not have uh, all the venues that we have access to uh, to trade. So we will probably concentrate on uh, some regulated institution like Coinbase, for instance, or even Binance, maybe, I don't know. So they will... Uh, they will just go there. They will obviously move away the price compared to other exchanges or other platforms. 
and VET could actually create, uh, you know, uh, an opportunities for us to step into place to try to arbitrage the market. We start moving coins around, but we'll obviously, us, nickel, everybody else will do it. The system is going to get congested. You know, to move Bitcoin, it takes, uh, you know, like instead of 10 minutes, it will take uh, two hours. You have seen over and over again, perpetual futures will go ballistic, etc. But it's all depending on the size of the first few days, because then the market will come down. So I... Honestly, it's a bit of a uh, tossing the coin kind of situation. I don't know, but definitely if we are talking about billions, the market will get congested. We'll, get, we'll definitely get congested and some people will get stopped out. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of volatility in the market. Uh, but yeah, but it's, I mean, it's normal. I think it's something you would expect for a major event like this one to happen. And, but I'm sure eventually the network and everything will cope as he always done in pretty much every situation. But I leave uh, to Martin and, and David to elaborate as well. But One of the issues I think that the ETFs will have is, so there's two ways that, that an authorized participant, they're the people that, that deal with you know, creating new units or, or redeeming money, uh, and then they onward sell to the market in the secondary market on exchange or OTC. So there's two ways that they can come into the ETF. One one way is, is what's called in specie in kind. So they deliver the Bitcoin to the fund, and, the, and then the, the the ETF will issue the new unit, new, new shares to to the AP, who then you know onward onward sells them on exchange, or whatever. And that you know that that's pretty pretty seamless, and and that's how we've done most of our trading, all of our trading so far. But I, I know that a lot of the interaction with the SEC has been about what's the other the other way is 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 cash orders, i.e. the AP will deliver cash, the fund gets the cash, the fund's got to buy the Bitcoin the problem. The problem there is the fund's only getting the cash in two days when it settles it. Um, Cause typically it'll be two days. It could be one day. They could shorten it, but they're not likely to get it straight away. Whereas you've got a pre-fund your purchase of, of, of Bitcoin. So this needs to be a funding element built into that, into this here. Um, and, and that could be pretty costly for these, uh, for these ETF cause they have to trade. They have to trade that day. It can't be, an active fund where it just you know it leaves it in cash, you know either because of operation or because of that's that's the view on the market. It's meant to have beta exposure. For every dollar invested, there should be a dollar's worth of Bitcoin. So they've got to get it, um, and that that could be quite an issue if there's such an influx of money coming in. I yeah I I'm a little bit. I hope that you guys are right. Um, but I'm maybe a little bit more sanguine on the ability of the market to absorb this. And like, it would be a wonderful day for Abraxas and for us if, if like Fabio's kind of uh, <laughs> conception happens, like we would be delighted. But I think like the truth is there's, uh, I don't know, let's say 2 billion of inflows on day one. Um, you know, Beto today is 1.5 billion. So like, let's say 2 billion comes into crypto ETF products. Like that would be a real, huge win. Um, every every ETF provider I'm sure would be happy with that outcome. There's like $20 billion of spot volumes in Bitcoin per day out of 50 billion total. There's another 30 billion of derivatives volume, rough numbers. You're going to have some physical outflow from GBTC. I think like the market clearing price on launch day is going to be inside of a 30% move. And like inside of that, a lot of physical Bitcoin will become available for sale. Is, is my hunch. And I think that there are, uh, unfortunately for us, a lot of arbitrages out there with capital to deploy who can move that liquidity from the rest of the market to where the APs are buying quite efficiently. Um, so I'm sure we'll see the best spreads we'll see all year, but I don't think the market sort of grinds to a halt or the blockchain is unusable or people blow off on it is, is that's kind of our base case here. Understood and appreciate all your, your insights on, on this matter and overall the topic. Um, it's, it's time to wrap up. And, and I, first of all, wants to want to thank you for your participation and sharing your overall knowledge uh, about the industry and about the ETF specifically. Um, hopefully, you know, we see this happening uh, very soon and it's a, a positive event uh, for the market. 
And I would really uh, want to thank you again and wishing you a happy holiday season coming uh, very soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Speak soon. Bye.